Ginobili puts on the finishing touches. Marshall throws it down. Damon Jones fires away. And there's the buzzer. The San Antonio Spurs are NBA champions once again. The Spurs just won their third title in five years. Tony Parker was named Finals MVP, joining Tim Duncan, who won it the last two times. And then there's Manu Ginobili, the third wheel who came off the bench, scoring 18 points per game. But look more closely and something unbelievable happens. Back in the first quarter, the Spurs were down by four before Manu checked in. And he immediately made his presence felt with a few big plays on both ends of the floor. When he went back to the bench near the end of the half, San Antonio had a seven-point lead. The Spurs were then outscored by three points without him to start the second, but again, Manu came in and did damage, drilling a three and then back-cutting some poor defender into a pair of free throws, and when he left at the end of the quarter, that lead was back to 10, only for it to evaporate when he went to the bench just so he could return in the fourth and start slicing his way through the Cleveland defense and finally put the Spurs in front for good with this high arcing three. This was just one game, but what if I told you that this pattern repeated itself in every game in this series, in more than just this series, and for more than just those playoffs? That Argentina's flying man was way ahead of his time that he was far more than one of the greatest six men to ever play, and at his peak, that he was a superstar hiding in plain sight. You are watching what greatness is all about. Where's Larry Bird in all this? Has it blocked by Elijah on? Michael Jordan saves the day. The first season of Greatest Peaks was about the best of the best. But this time we're looking at trendsetters, unique archetypes, and even controversial players who make up the legends of NBA offense. L.A. happens, and I remember Kobe Bryant saying to me when Manu came in to the game, like, Bruce, who's that white boy? I said, oh, he ain't no... He ain't a white boy. He, he arts a teeny. Ginobili was like a shot of adrenaline, crossing over dudes and hurling himself toward the basket, changing directions like a pinball, before gliding to the hoop with some crazy finish. He sort of flowed like water through small cracks in the defense, bending and slithering into tiny creases with some of the most unique and creative movements in league history. Like... He didn't wrap the ball behind his back for flair, but for function. He cuts left here, and instead of a crossover, he protects the ball by putting it behind his back. And here he uses it to wedge between two defenders, and notice that quick little direction change there before spinning it off the corner of the backboard like a pool shark. He had these deceptively sharp cutbacks, where his upper body barely moves, but his hips change directions, and suddenly he's by you. Most shifty ball handlers who can cut quickly plant a foot in the ground and turn their entire body. They often have very flexible ankles and get low to the floor to explode laterally. But Ginobili had flexible hips and even knees that helped him turn. The hips are facing the baseline, then suddenly the corner, and that's because his left leg turns mid-stride to redirect him, and he never really has to stop running because of this. His torso then turned after his hips, so it's harder to see that he's changing directions and defenders can be a step slow reacting. I also think this slithered him through tight spaces where others wouldn't even dare. He's headed directly into the defender here, turns that left leg again, nearly lands on his foot, then slips the right leg through with a long stride and rolls it in. This technique gave him a different pace than most players coming off screens and exploding to the rim. So he had a ton of force and power moving through contact to the hoop. Being left-handed helped too, because defenders weren't accustomed to his driving angles. The shot blockers used to going right here, but Manu's shifting back to the left. 
and this is all one-legged leaping where he uses his speed to glide around opponents. He'd also take strange angles on his drives in the paint, moving more right to left across the face of the basket instead of assaulting it head on. And his use of English and touch helped him finish on these approaches. We actually saw this earlier against Cleveland, where he doesn't move to the front of the rim, avoids the shop locker, and spins it in near the square. He also threw people off with the timing and acceleration of his drives, taking these big long steps past defenders, and noticed the early gather and the power with those two big strides. And his pickup timing and pace messed with people. Rashid Wallace thinks he's jumping here, but he has a second step after the gather and flies right by him. The natural progression of these moves was the legendary Euro step, planting in one direction to pick it up and go in the other. And today the move is used across the world, largely defined by that quick single sidestep, but Ginobili's had a second step after he picked up the dribble early. Back in the mid-2000s, this unorthodox footwork surprised defenders, where he charges at an opponent, plants the foot one way on the pickup, then gets two steps the other way through traffic. Because his lower body was so sturdy, he packed a lot of punch on these drives. So he could Euro step at high speeds like a blur, watch him lean his upper body in one direction as the legs turn the other way, and NASA should really study this dude. Ginobili! In addition to the Euro, he could just cross people too. There's another shop locker running the wrong way. You're going the wrong way! And one of his go-to moves was splitting the double team like this, where he could make a 90-degree turn and then bring the thunder. Because he's part magician, he'd do this with a behind-the-back dribble as well. And again, this was functional because he protects the ball with his body as he goes by, and he could turn at an atypical point in the dribble. He doesn't have to plant hard on the outside foot, lean forward, and make space for a crossover. Instead, he just swivels his hips in between dribbles and teleports right through a defender. He also went behind the back for his step back jumper, and this might be the most insane combination of dribbling moves that I've ever seen, going Leo Messi on three all-stars and finishing with the sham god at the end. The man was dropping people with the chamois since he entered the league in 2003. This is the fourth quarter of Game 6 of the Western Conference Finals, and he went to it not once, but twice down the stretch. Ginobili took a ton of free throws during his peak years in the playoffs, and his total volume of rim attempts and trips to the line is only slightly behind the leading guards and wings this century, so he was difficult to keep out of the paint and he could use that paint pressure to set up his step back. Manu didn't really elevate to shoot over defenders, so he used the step back to create space on the outside. And while sometimes these were long twos, he took plenty of threes off the dribble as well. This gave him a futuristic shot profile, where three quarters of his field goal attempts were either at the rim or from behind the three-point line, similar to guards 20 years later. Damian Lillard didn't have that shot profile until 2020, and from 2005 to 2008, Manu drilled 39% of his threes. Since he was a pick-and-roll heavy guard, that meant teams couldn't sag under the screen or he'd make them pay. But if you chase him over the screen, he can get into the paint and make love to the hoop. And in the exact same setup, he can reuse the screen, get to that left hand, and hit a teammate right in the mitts. Or if Duncan doesn't roll, he can Euro step into space and kick it out when the extra defender is pulled over to stop that left hand, and that leads to more great offense. Seattle started trapping Ginobili in this game, with a third defender shifted over to help, and that opened the backside pass. And a minute later, they're in the same coverage again, so Manu throws a fastball for a dunk this time, and he just patiently picked this defense apart with a subtle ball fake and another dime on the inside. 
So he was dangerous in the pick and roll, reading the defense, pulling up from three, or finding ways to slice through defenders and score at the basket. Yet, he never averaged more than 21 points or six assists per game. So why didn't he put up bigger numbers? Why did he occasionally come off the bench? And why wasn't he given a bigger role in the San Antonio offense? You know, I'm trying to be Mr. Coach, and he's doing things that are, say, a little bit too mustardy for me. And I would tend to try to correct him probably a little bit too much and try to pull him in. Manu joined the Spurs in the 2003 season after leading Argentina to a silver medal in the 02 World Cup, stunning Team USA in the process. Prior to that, he won back-to-back Italian League MVPs, but the Spurs actually drafted him before all of his international success when he was an unknown 21-year-old rookie in Italy. As a 25-year-old NBA rookie, expectations weren't very high, but on his second NBA possession, he was in perfect position to take away a layup from a Kobe Bryant pass, and there were a number of vintage Ginobili moments throughout this game that would become the norm in the following seasons. Now, there certainly was an adjustment period, both for Ginobili to acclimate to the NBA as a sidekick next to a dominant post player, and for coach Greg Popovich to understand Manu's unique game. Here's how he described it during Ginobili's retirement. So I, I had to learn to stop going and say, Manu, geez, oh whiz, what? Do we need that? What do you, why? Well, I am Manu, this is what I do. And he grew more comfortable in his second year in 2004, but he didn't fully unleash himself until 2005 after becoming a full-time starter. Although, I wonder if that could have happened sooner, given how dominant he looked in the 04 Olympics, leading Argentina to a gold medal at 27. The ball handling, playmaking, and unique athleticism were on full display. And his development as a pick-and-roll passer was a key step in becoming a primary offensive weapon. When the big man steps up to meet his penetration, he could blend the drive into a great roll pass, or if that defender left the screener, he could look at the roller to open up a pass to the wing. He could do it the other way too, looking to the corner to throw off the big man and squeeze in a layup pass. And I love how decisive he is with some of these quick dishes to the roller, where he attacks right as the screen arrives and then reads the defense quickly, often manipulating defenders with his head movement before whipping one off the dribble. This time he gets downhill off the screen and hits this defender with the ball fake and then passes. Duncan was able to corral that one. Although sometimes the passes were a little too ambitious for Timmy's hands. And other times Mono was trying to hit a home run and they weren't on the same page. He could be a little overzealous with some of his deliveries on some of these big ideas. Or as Tony Parker put it, because when Mano is two pass, you have the legend pass that everybody will talk about, a one of unbelievable pass, and the stands to the fans pass. I don't think he was actually that aggressive on some of these reads, though. If anything, he could have a few blind spots when operating from up top, maybe because he wasn't tall enough to see over bodies or find the right angle. But when he did see it, he threw some serious fastballs from out there, including what's probably the fastest pass ever in 2012 against the Lakers. That speed really helped on his kickouts, where he could spray it out to shooters after attacking, and here it comes all the way back to him to finish the job. And this time he gets downhill into the paint and goes to the one-handed bullet to the corner shooter. He also had some really slick dimes in transition, anticipating this tiny opening before Ben Wallace happens. And I love that he faked this one to no one to move this defender out of the way for a dunk. But I do think that pick and roll was a perfect setup for his scoring and playmaking skills because he could read the coverage and exploit it, crossing back into space. And here it's a Euro step or you can spray it to a shooter. 
If the coverage is too soft, he'll pop a three off the dribble. And if teams successfully forced him left into the big man, he could use his sorcery to stress the defense anyway. As he developed those pick and roll reads, his scoring and playmaking role expanded, with his offensive load peaking in 2008 just behind the league's heaviest lifters. This coincided with an increased role for Tony Parker, while Tim Duncan was gradually featured less in the offense over the course of the decade. So Ginobili was a co-pilot out there, but could he have been more? Should he have been more? Maybe his lack of a mid-range game prevented him from being a grade-A superstar during that era. He wasn't someone who could rise up and fire over defenders and hit a difficult shot on demand. But I actually think that was a minor blessing because instead of forcing inefficient mid-rangers, he would often have space to shoot, but instinctively look for something better and more efficient. On a weak offensive team, forcing a 15-footer might be ideal, but on a good team, they can just reset into something much harder to guard and Parker kicks it back to Manu for three free throws. Ginobili took, by far, the fewest mid-range shots of the big three, and that helped him reach efficiency heights that Duncan and Parker never touched. And per possession, he looked like the better scorer for basically his entire prime. Manu would have put up bigger numbers, but he was willing to wait for screening actions to unfold like this, then default to a Duncan post-up while he looked for cracks on the weak side, and Timmy misses him for a short turnaround instead. A minute later, he doesn't force anything in transition, but instead of resetting into a pick and roll, Duncan wants to post again. Manu clears to the other side, and so Tony Parker's left with a less efficient long two. I wouldn't call Duncan Postup's bad offensive possessions for the Spurs. He was a fairly effective scorer and could set up teammates. But in general, it's harder for post players to create really good offense without elite passing and scoring. And Duncan had plenty of bumpy possessions down there in his late 20s and early 30s while Manu was at his peak. According to Synergy tracking data, from 2005 to 2008, Ginobili pick and rolls were worth about eight additional points every 100 playoff possessions, but the Spurs went to a Duncan post-up nearly twice as often. The offense was also better when Ginobili played without Duncan than when Duncan played without Ginobili. So it's hard for me to view all these Duncan post-ups as an optimal approach once Manu emerged. When we looked at their overall offensive load, Ginobili passed Duncan after a few years. But look at what happens when the big three shares the floor together. Duncan is still ahead of Ginobili for most of his prime, with Parker doing the most when all three are out there together. When only one of them is out there alone, Duncan occasionally ramps up the volume, but it's Ginobili who does some serious heavy lifting, averaging 28 points per 75 while creating like a superstar wing. So despite looking like the best scorer and playmaker on the team, Manu took on the smallest role when the big three played together. But without the benefit of 2020 hindsight, just how valuable was he playing this more complimentary role next to two other stars? The way the team was set up, we all needed each other. And without Manu, there were no championships. No Ginobili discussion is complete without addressing his playing time. Manu peaked at about 36 to 37 minutes in key playoff series, and during his prime played just 33 minutes a night in the postseason. This was during an era when the best players usually logged 40 plus minutes in big series, so even as a starter, Gino played less than most great players, and I've always wondered why. One idea is that Coach Pop staggered Parker and Ginobili to always have a star ball handler out there, although that has minor benefits in the playoffs when everyone plays so many minutes anyway. 
Another possible reason was Manu's chaotic rogue improvisation that sometimes drove Pop mad. But the most interesting explanation to me has always been about Ginobili's intense high revving motor. He's described himself as having only one gear back then, and that was especially true on defense, because unlike most star wings, he didn't conserve energy on that end and was incredibly active, always looking to make a big play, while also willing to switch and bang against much bigger opponents. It's outside of the scope of this series, but I find Mano's defense incredibly impressive. He had really good awareness of threats in the paint, often rotating early. He fought through screens and chased opponents around like he was a defensive specialist. And he had a knack for making big defensive plays in big games. He also has the reputation of a gambler, and he certainly did gamble at times, but Manu wasn't constantly compromising his team structure by taking unnecessary risks, and a lot of his gambits were calculated and paid off. If he had played enough minutes to qualify, he would have finished in the top five in steal rate every year for the first five years of his career. And I think this defense is a key reason the Spurs always look so good with him on the floor. From 2005 to 2007, San Antonio outscored opponents by a whopping 13 points per hundred with Manu in the game, nearly 11 points better than when he sat on the bench. In the same time frame, the Spurs were plus 12 with Duncan on the court, and they saw a 13 point drop off when he went to the bench. So per possession, they look like co-captains of the ship. Maybe Manu couldn't play more because of his style, in the same way that pace and space stars today play less because of the increased demands on their body. Ginobili hustled his way into his share of injuries, and there should be books written about his toughness. This is from a postseason game he played with a broken arm crashing to the floor, then just a few seconds later, flying in to steal an offensive rebound and create another shot for a teammate. He once ruptured a testicle and somehow walked off without crying like a newborn, though I suppose that's nothing for a man who swats bats out of the air. <laughs> anyway, the point here is that he burned bright all over the court, and that might have optimized his overall value while capping his minutes. Even on offense, despite running possessions through Duncan and Parker, Manu was still active away from the ball. They go with the Parker Duncan pick and roll here. Phoenix defends it well, and now Ginobili's reading the play, ready to dart into an opening and make something happen out of nowhere. He was a dangerous cutter because he spotted little cracks to slice into, and at 6'6 in shoes, he was big enough to finish in the lane. But where he really excelled was attacking closeouts on the catch like this where a teammate moves Manu's defender just a touch and he instantly goes and finds something better. This is the concept of point five, acting within half a second of receiving the ball to strain defenses. And unless Manu was waiting for a screen or a set play to unfold, he was quick to act with the rock, relocating to a soft spot here, which was the straw that broke the defense's back. The Spurs set up a Duncan post up on this one. Detroit fronts him, which means a backside defender needs to slide over, and Ginobili exploits even a mini closeout just off that ball reversal. This style of play fits so well next to other offensive talent because it capitalizes on the advantages they create, serving as an offensive lubricant that takes good shots and finds even better ones. So his off-ball game works next to various archetypes because he was a good catch-and-shoot weapon, he was dangerous running into handoffs like this, or adjusting a route like that and flaring into the corner for an open triple, and when the ball hit him on the move, he was quick to pass as well. We know that Ginobili and Duncan had similar footprints when they were on versus off the court in the regular season. But in those playoffs, we finally see some separation. 
the Spurs outscored opponents by eight points per 100 with Duncan on the court and Ginobili on the bench. And they were outscored by three points per 100 when Manu played without Timmy. That's the first major piece of evidence we've seen that suggests Ginobili was more of a sidekick. And it's completely wrong. It's actually Manu's minutes that the Spurs dominated and Duncan's units who were outscored without Ginobili. Yes, that's right. The Spurs won two titles and made three conference finals by crushing teams with Ginobili on the court and then struggled mightily when he went to the bench. Remember, these are small samples, and Duncan played six more minutes per game, so his impact couldn't be as targeted, but this same pattern holds from 2004 to 2011, where San Antonio was better in Ginobili's playoff minutes in every postseason other than 2010. Manu also looks like the better player in our box score model in more than half of those series, and along with the regular season signals, that gives him a pretty good argument as the most valuable spur during his prime years. After all, Duncan played through nagging injuries during the middle of the 2000s, yet San Antonio peaked during those seasons when Ginobili fully actualized. Personally, I'm skeptical that he could have played 40 minutes a night and carried a franchise, but on a well-built team, he was an amazing two-way player who provided some monumental impact throughout his career. So, despite coming off the bench, and despite his reduced minutes, I think there's a strong case that Manu Ginobili was San Antonio's other superstar. To support this channel, check out patreon.com slash thinkingbasketball. We have a ton of additional content, including a lot of the historical stats that contributed to researching this video. We also have episodes of the Thinking Basketball podcast devoted to finals and conference finals MVPs. And I'm a big believer Manu should have won both in 2005. Let me know what you think. Hope you enjoyed this one. And of course, whether you're in Argentina or Italy or anywhere else in the world, I hope you are having a great day.